Hello, I'm Mohamed Chinara. In today's video, we will be reviewing the dural anatomy and discuss pertinent features relating to intracranial hemorrhage. This is a diagram that I trust will help you to understand the basics of the meningeal coverings of the brain so that you can better understand the patterns of hemorrhage. Let's start by talking about the different meningeal coverings. The first of which to raise your attention to is the pia mater shown by this red line overlying the cerebrum indicated by the red filled color here and here. The pia mater you should consider is almost like cling film surrounding the brain parenchyma and for all intents and purposes is inseparable. Hemorrhage that occurs deep to the pia mater is typically intraparenchymal hemorrhage or intraventricular hemorrhage if it's within the brain parenchyma or ventricular system respectively. Superficial to the pia but deep to the arachnoid mater is a real space which under normal circumstances exists in all of us and that's called the subarachnoid space and you can see it here. It surrounds the brain and bathes it to help maintain a degree of neurochemical stability. It's important to note that the subarachnoid space extends into all of these various cell sci that you can see here. Superficial to the arachnoid mater still is the dura mater and superficial to that is the skull vault. If we start to unpick the hemorrhages now, let's try and give this a bit of context. If you get hemorrhage that occurs superficial to the pia mater, but deep to the arachnoid mater, that hemorrhage is within the subarachnoid space outlined in blue. And so we call that type of hemorrhage a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see, and I hope you'd be able to appreciate that hemorrhage can therefore fill any of these sulci. And that is typical of subarachnoid hemorrhage indicated here. Superficial to the arachnoid mater, but deep to the dura mater is a potential space called the subdural space. Under normal circumstances, this does not exist and it's only visible under pathological scenarios. When elderly patients and alcoholic patients typically have head injuries, they rupture small venous channels running through the subdural space and therefore results in a subdural hematoma that occupies the subdural space. This is highlighted here. Superficial to the dura mater, but deep to the periosteum of the skull vault, is another potential space called the extradural space. Again, under normal circumstances, this does not exist, but when there are pathological scenarios, these spaces reveal themselves. Extradural hematomas are typical in patients who suffer trauma to a part of their skull called the terion, which is naturally or innately vulnerable. If they do so, they get occupation of the extradural space by an extradural hematoma, shown here. We'll show you some examples on the coming slides. This is an example of an extradural hematoma. I trust you will be able to appreciate that this patient has suffered significant intracranial injury. And this is evidenced initially by this significant soft tissue or scalp hematoma overlying their vault. There has been evidence of previous surgery indicated by these arrows here, and you can ignore this for the time being. Here you can see a typical appearance of an extradural hematoma, which is biconvex or lens shaped in appearance. It appears bright white because the hemorrhage is acute, and it is limited by a suture here and here, giving it these pinched ends at the extremity. In patients who suffer extradural hematomas, it's absolutely critical when you see a hemorrhage to look for the associated fracture. As I alluded to earlier, this patient has suffered previous neuro intervention and as a result, they has some abnormalities to their skull vault here. We can ignore these for the time being. However, there are at least one, two and three fracture lines which in the context of acute hemorrhage raises the significant likelihood that this patient has suffered intracranial trauma as a result of some form of traumatic brain injury. This is a different patient. You can see that the abnormality is much more subtle in this patient. It's outlined by the arrow here. This looks like a crescenteric collection of fluid which is lower in density than compared to the previous image 
That is because as hemorrhages age and become older, the body starts to digest the clot and so it becomes less dense. That is to say, in simple terms, that acute hemorrhages tend to appear bright white on CT scans and as they become older, they become progressively more darker. So this is a more chronic hematoma. In the same patient, you can appreciate this crescenteric collection overlying the right cerebral hemisphere in a lot more detail. These crescenteric collections are typical of subdural hematomas and given the density of this, this is a chronic subdural hematoma. These typically occur in patients who have underlying brain atrophy. So that is to say alcoholic patients or patients who have age-related changes. As a result of the atrophy, when they suffer trauma, the comparatively smaller brains swing like a pendulum within a capacious skull vault. As it does so, the inertial forces on the traversing subdural veins that are crossing in the subdural space rupture and they fill the subdural space with hemorrhage that you can see here. This is a different patient. You would expect the false cerebri to be here and it's so thin it's almost imperceptible. This is a markedly thickened right tentorial leaflet and this is a mildly thickened left tentorial leaflet. The thickening of the tentorial leaflet is a result of hemorrhage and this is another example of acute subdural hemorrhage and what it can look like. At this stage, I would advise you to go back to the cartoon image to remind yourself of the subarachnoid space so that you can understand this pattern of hemorrhage better. Here is a normal left cerebral sulcus. Here is a similarly looking normal cerebral sulcus as are these here. You'll notice that this sulcus is filled with high density hemorrhage and there are a couple of further sulci anteriorly that are also filled with high density hemorrhage. This is classical of acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. This patient has a significant traumatic injury to their scalp and the arrow is now indicating the dressing that has been used to tamponade or to limit the bleeding. In the same patient, a couple of slides down, you can see several normal looking cerebral sulci indicated by the arrow at several sites. This is a comparatively normal sylvian fissure. If we compare this to the other side, you'll see that this sylvian fissure on the right now is filled with acute hemorrhage, as are several sulci within the right cerebral hemisphere. The appearances are again typical of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Again, you can see the dressing overlying the posterior aspect of the vault to limit the traumatic bleed from the extracranial soft tissues. This is an example of catastrophic intracranial hemorrhage from a scan that was recently reported in the region. You can see extensive intracranial hemorrhage evidenced by a lot of blood within the ventricular system and a large hematoma within the right, occipital, parietal and temporal regions dissecting into the ventricular system. The left and right temporal horns are grossly dilated and the appearances are entirely typical with obstructive hydrocephalus. Here is the same patient's CT scan with no annotations for you to look through at your leisure. Thanks for watching. I trust this was useful for you. Please get in touch if you have any further or specific queries.